very excited for this webinar that we have tonight. And uh, I'm very excited to have Sam Kasirsky, uh, business development manager for IQVIA with us. He was one of the first business development managers uh, for the IQVIA MedTech division that was uh, launched in 2019, I believe. Is that right, Sam? Yep. April of 2019. So I was uh, one of the first uh, inside sales folks uh, with our IQVIA MedTech group when we launched the brand name uh, back then. And uh, it's been an incredible journey. And so I've been with our uh, our MedTech CRO for, I guess, two and a half years and, and with the larger IQVIA for a little over three years now. Uh, nice. So, a bachelor's yeah. in, in biology at Tar Heel from uh, yep. University of North Carolina, uh, one of six children. So you, you had to fight for your food, of course. You, you're not shy, I'm sure. And um, right. uh, I love some of your some of your hobbies, too. So you might have to tell some jokes at some point. I, I thought that was great that you actually, you know, spend some time with writing and things like that to do that. But very yeah. excited uh, to have you on today to, to, to talk to our following and talk about uh, emerging med tech and when is the right time to start having those conversations and what are the right questions to ask as you start to think about as that company uh, evolution progresses, when's that right time to start thinking about a CRO? Yep, absolutely. No. And Darwin, thanks for having me. I'm excited to, to be here and talk with you today. Um, I, I think, you know, getting into the approach here, uh, you know, I think hopefully will be really helpful for definitely earlier stage companies, right. That might not be as familiar working with CROs or, um, or exploring their options, right, and, and right. understanding that IQVIA MedTech is one of many. Um, so, no, look forward to this discussion. And uh, again, thanks for having me. Well, it's and it's easy because to your point, you just talked about the the, the scale there, right, and the, the amount of companies out there. So it's easy to not know what you don't know, and yep. it's easy for things to get a little bit blurry in terms of where where you go to. So hopefully, we can share some content that brings value in how to go about that process and how to think about it in a way to pick the right partner. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so let's, let's dive right into that. If, if I'm the CEO of a uh, company that's starting to think about those types of things and needs that type of resources, what, what should I be thinking about? What types of questions should I be asking Sam? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So, you know, a lot of times when I think small companies or emerging med techs come to us, right, they're not sure of, of how the process will look like, right? Who am I going to engage with when I go to a company like IQVIA MedTech? You know, am I going to be speaking directly with operations and giving them an overview of, you know, what I need to do in order to get that regulatory approval? Um, am I going to be speaking to someone in business development? Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of times companies come to us and, and ask us to liaise for them, right? And that's really my role uh, as a business development manager uh, is to, you know, listen to what uh, the company's objectives are, right? Where they are in their development stage. Um, are they uh, pre first in human study? Are they in a pivotal study stage and have collected some data to, uh, to that extent? Mm -hmm. um, have they had conversations with the FDA pre sub? Um, you know, where are they in protocol development? Things like that. Um, obviously, money uh, and funding is a big factor, right? Um, and, you know, the one thing that I think is really important for emerging med techs to consider, you know, when approaching a CRO is just understanding that it is a two way street, right, in terms of, of how we collaborate. Um, so, you know, we can be as helpful as you want us to be in terms of helping you with those investment conversations. It's very frequent that we have customers approach us uh, asking for price points that they need to use to approach investment groups. Uh, and, and really dive into what the CRO cost might look like and what they're going to need the CRO to help them execute in a clinical study. Uh, that's, so that's so, yeah. so smart. And what you're talking about to me is being a partner, right? And it, we, it absolutely we, is. we have those conversations every single day because our goal is not to be a vendor, it's to be a partner, just like this forum right here tonight, bringing uh, value in a variety of ways. So you can, as you have those conversations, you're understanding where they're at in the process, what's important to them, what areas where maybe they have some blind spots or they need some direction and understanding. And then taking that a step further, because I, I think there's probably some people that don't realize that you're actually, after understanding where they're at, can give them pointers and direction on how to go about getting that additional funding that they need. Absolutely. Right. And, and I think, 
you know, when we issue our proposals, it's not a, a plug and chug per se, right? Like we really view each study as a case by case basis, as I think most CROs do. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not like we have, you know, fixed pricing um, that we just throw into uh, onto paper and say, here you go, take it to the your uh, investment group or, or whoever you're talking to. Um, we really do try to put strategy input and considerations as to why we budget for certain scope, right? So when we scope our project management hours per se, or what we foresee for data management, uh, or what we foresee for regulatory support, really depends on what the company is going to need uh, when they approach an investment group, uh, or, or what support they're going to need that they're not going to be able to uh, you, keep in house. Yeah. Do you give them some insight in terms of how they should allocate? They're we, how they're investing yeah. in. Okay. Certainly can. And, you know, part of the reason we're able to do that is because of our wealth of um, expertise and experience in the med tech space and running these studies, right? So we we have a database of knowledge to go off of and a database of current study support, looking at similar predicate studies when applicable and being able to configure those uh, foreseen operational hours and resources that will be needed for a study. So, you're you're sitting down with somebody you're you're the first point of contact to understand what their challenges are so you can identify and provide the right solutions what type of questions should they they be asking you what are the top you know three to five questions let's say that should be first before determining what direction to go uh number one in my opinion is timelines ask timelines um you know what is my path to first patient in right and then we have the the experience having these conversations uh, with uh, a variety of med tech companies to be able to help advise on that, right? And very methodical in how we approach timelines and how we're going to get to that FPI, right? Be it the regulatory component, uh, finding the right sites and and getting the sites on board, uh, doing the IRB submissions or uh, or submissions to ECs, depending on uh, I guess which geography you're looking to run the study in. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the conversations with the FDA, I guess that sort of preludes uh, the, the regulatory part that I just mentioned. Um, there's just a lot of things to consider, right, and in, in getting to that first patient enrolled. And um, I think it just has to be appreciated that it can be a tedious process, right? It's not easy. I think, right. you know, some, you know, and I, I think that's important for companies to just know across the board, right? None of this is easy stuff. It's very technical. Um, and, you know, anybody that says it's easy is, I think, lying. Um, but you know, we have the right folks and and resources in place, uh, with different areas of knowledge to be able to help companies understand what those timelines look like. And then once you get to that first patient in, right, looking at generally, what is your patient population? Um, and, you know, depending on where the sites are as well, how will that affect enrollment rate? Um, and, you know, I know we'll get into some of the pandemic influences, but as you can imagine, COVID-19 is really, uh, shaking things up uh, in the med tech market, um, in some ways good, in some ways bad, right? Depending on what type of device and product you're developing. Um, but, you know, the benefit, I think, of, of our group or really a, a, a established CRO um, is they should have the knowledge to be able to give you good advisory on what that looks like. And I think that ultimately helps emerging med tech companies, especially build their go-to-market strategy, right? And that path to commercialization. Well, picking a partner that understands the landscape provides the right information so you can make the best decisions to proactively put your plan in place and then be able to execute on it. If you don't have that lined up correctly, then, you know, obviously the the cost of data that doesn't doesn't bring real value is huge, uh, a huge misfire. Right. Um, Absolutely. Okay. What, What are a couple additional questions after that that they should be focused on next? I, I think just be honest too, or, and ask about budget, right. And press on it. Um, you know, I think sometimes companies, uh, once we put forth a proposal or when any CRO puts forth a proposal, thinks that's final, right. That's it. That's, yeah. that's not the case. I mean, we are open to discussion, right. On, on where we can meet you halfway and really create that partnership. Um, of course, right. Every company has its bottom lines and there's a point of no return. We'll just put it at that. Right. But it's, it's something that we're open to discuss and, and definitely press on it too. Right. And, and understand why do certain things uh, cost what they do and, and why are certain units priced out as they are um, regardless of who you're approaching. Right. And, and um, I think that's been something that's important and, you know, 
let's be honest, a lot of companies already know that because uh, they wouldn't be approaching us and asking us to price out services if that already wasn't a question. But really do press on it. Don't look at the first pass as the end all be all. Um, look at it as it really is a, a starting point. Um, and, uh, you know, if we are going to create that partnership, then there has to be that dialogue. Because you're going to have things as you as as you get more information, mm-hmm. and you get past the there's things that you don't know what you don't know. So as you get yep. continue to go down that path, you may identify areas where you're going to get more value, more ROI based on the dollars that you're going to spend, and then that perception changes, and maybe you 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 change what your game plan looks like. Absolutely, and you know I think the third question Darwin um, to them poses and. It's not one that I've actually heard often, but, you know, I think about it, I think is important is how are you going to grow with me Um, Mm -hmm. and and really listen to the company's approach. And, you know, what is their end goal here? You know, is it a company that's going to be able to help you through that initial pilot? And then that's where they're done. And that's it. Right. Right. I mean, just be very honest with that. Or is this a company that can go from pilot um, to pivotal uh, to getting that FDA approval? Um, to being able to help you uh, manage post-market surveillance or post-market regulatory requirements, Um, maybe different market access reimbursement initiatives as well to help you with your commercialization. So really understand and ask the company, where does the buck stop with you? Um, And, uh, you know, how far in the process can you be with us? And I think that's a something to consider too, right? If you're really looking to create long-term partnerships um, and build trust between organizations, because a lot of the times, I mean, this is what it boils down to, right? A trust that IQV MedTech or whichever CRO partner you bring into board uh, is going to do a successful job of, of helping you, um, you know, with the end goal of bringing your product to the patients that need it most, right? Yeah. Um, so ask those questions and, 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 you know, definitely press on the, the we'll say CRO or vendor to be uh, forthright with you. Yeah, I love that what you just talked about, because and I always say every time we interact, whether it's a client, a candidate in terms of what we do day in and day out, every single time you gain credibility or you lose it. And as you build that relationship and you gain gain credibility, right, you add trust and you start to identify other areas where you can bring each other value. And so from that standpoint, picking the right partner up front so you don't have to keep changing partners if you have somebody that can bring more value and and, and uh, move into other areas to bring yeah. value then obviously the efficiency of that and you, and you don't have to keep going out and looking for new relationships right and look i mean i i don't think we can be naive you know you're not always going to get it right on the first pass and that is completely fine right and and i think majority of companies don't um, and it might take multiple tries before they find that true long-term partner. But yeah. I think just pressing that question, right, can at least help to vet through some of those growing pains uh, or perceived growing pains that might come, you know, if you do elect to uh, uh, move forward with a certain CRO. No, that's great. All right. So I, I think that's great advice. I appreciate you going through that. So let's talk, let's talk about IQVIA. Let's talk about the value prop there. I'm going to put up uh you know, this particular slide. And let's talk a little bit about what differentiates IQVIA. Yeah. My daily job, right? Right. So this I, is, you, this is, you should be able to do well here, right? <laughs> I, I, you know, if I don't, then I think IQVIA is going to reconsider why they even have me. So we'll, we'll edit, uh, we'll edit, but go ahead. <laughs> right. We'll edit. Um, so again, and I know I mentioned this a little, I think earlier, our biggest differentiator, especially within our IQVIA MedTech clinical or CRO, is our expertise and experience. Um, and, you know, what I think that really boils down to is we have a vetted QMS uh, with vetted operations and SOPs. And I think something that a lot of times companies take for granted is that is a very tedious and long process and credibility to develop. Uh, compared to um, newer or or smaller CROs out in the market. Um, You know, I think a lot of times uh, CROs have the therapeutic knowledge in-house, but don't necessarily have the the SOPs or the right structure in place to be able to carry out that clinical execution. Um, And, you know, these systems that I'm referring to in SOPs are something that have been vetted through audits, um, you know, review by regulatory bodies, FDA, ethics committees, et cetera, um, in order to build that credibility. 
And even though there's guidelines put forth by the FDA, uh, EU notified bodies, right, as we all see in the news, the way to go about the clinical execution as it pertains to those guidelines is definitely left open to interpretation. Yeah. Thus, if you're going to do the clinical execution, you're really relying and you're using a CRO, you're really relying on the CRO to have that experience to know what that clinical execution needs to look like. And so that really just ties back to what I think a big differentiator of ours is, is that we have that decades uh, from our legacy companies, right? Janai, Novella, decades of experience and expertise running these studies um, and being able to help companies manage that regulatory pathways in order to get to approval. And I would think that the regulatory compliance piece is, you know, obviously it's extremely important, Mm -hmm. but understanding the key aspects of that and how that's going to affect your trial, if you do something wrong or you go down the wrong path, uh, yep. is a huge aspect of of the support that you're getting from CRO. Am it I absolutely wrong there? No, you you are completely right. And you know, I think um, on the the uh, slide that you just had pulled up there too, you know, what I'm talking to really does then relate to uh, things that are mentioned here, right? Um, sort of our expertise and, and our different, uh, you know, centers of excellences that we're able to use and really just all the eyes that we we use to review a study and put forth, you know, a detailed and high quality solution on a case by case basis. Um, so we have uh, an expertise in a range of, of therapeutic areas. Right. I think I believe we have 16 different therapeutic area center of excellences within the larger IQVIA. Um, and within those, uh, we have dedicated physicians and and former uh, MDs and PhDs that have um, uh, the indication knowledge, right? To be able to look at a study and, and advise, you know, what looks right and what, what looks wrong. Um, ultimately, you know, determining what the design should look like to be able to best fit the patient journey and, and get the data that you're going to want to be able to um, then use to, you know, submit to a regulatory body or whatever the initiative might be. Um, so a a big differentiator of ours really is our people. Um, and, and, you know, we live and breathe, uh, med tech, uh, within IQVIA med tech, obviously. Um, (laughs) and, you know, I, I think even though IQVIA med tech is a part of the large IQVIA, we really do function as a small nimble group, um, that is able to work closely with med tech companies. Um, I like to almost think of IQVIA MedTech as the black sheep within the larger IQVIA. Um, you know, we, we were obviously we, we have the resources to be able to tap into IQVIA, but we really are our own thing. Um, and it's really cool to be able to be a part of that. How how do you how does supporting your client relevant to patient selection, um, you know, in terms of there's been a lot of, of uh, information communication out there and you even look at COVID, right? In terms yeah. of different uh, minorities or different uh, ethnicities being affected differently from the virus. So how do you help companies in terms of selection of patient population and that criteria and making sure that that balance there in terms of the total value of, of the outcomes of the study brings? Absolutely. Um, so the benefit of IQVIA um, is in addition to the, the CRO or traditional CRO components, right? We also have our IMS Health Group, right, which is the world's uh, largest brokerage of healthcare data analytics, which is extremely important when you start looking into patient populations and site networks and figuring out, you know, where it makes the most sense to set up sites, recruit, conduct the study, right, and that, which informs your study design. So we're able to tap in and leverage those, those data resources to be able to inform uh, the things that you had mentioned there. Um, and, and it's very, very high level, I know, but you know, once you start getting into the the types of data, I mean, it, you can spend hours, right? Talking yeah, it's about hard. It's hard not to be. I mean, it's hard not to be high level because it depends on the parameters of the study mm-hmm. and what you're trying to to show. Absolutely, you're trying to evaluate. Yeah, and it's global data too, right? So I, I think another big benefit of ours, just put simply, is we have boots on the ground and SOPs and really all major geographies um, and are able to help um, uh, companies run studies uh, globally. Uh, I will say of note, um, the one uh, geography that we are more infant in building out our capabilities for at this moment is South America within MedTech, Mm -hmm. um, just of note. But 
we uh, have done really strong work, US, Europe, Asia Pac, um, Australia is a, is a really uh, growing market, a fast and growing market as well for med tech. So studies um, all over the world. Yep. And, uh, and, and, you know, especially when you're talking to companies that intend to go after more than one regulatory approval, that's important to consider too, right? Going back to what does that partnership look like and where does the, how, how far can you grow with us? Um, I, I think that's another important thing to consider there um, is the global footprint. Absolutely. I mean, we talk about that in terms of the process in regulatory strategy in medical device. I mean, it's important in, in, in pharma biotech as well, but determining where you want to start. You want to start in the U.S., you want to start in the EU. And what does that look like? Because you need to be looking ahead in that process, not just at, yeah. at what the current situation is, because the cost and, uh, you know, that process is extremely important. It definitely is. And that might even segue a little bit into, I, I know we want to touch on EU MDR and, and IVDR as well yeah. a little bit. That's a very um, pertinent topic in the med tech industry and, and definitely plays an influence on deciding where to start. Not for all companies, but uh, definitely for a large number of them, because it's something we've been approached with. Yeah, yeah. everybody, you know, obviously MDR is uh, a little bit more in, uh, sense of urgency. The IVDR is not far behind it, though, uh, from that standpoint. Yeah. Anything else uh, you want to throw out about IQV before we move on to the next topic? One thing that I do want to, I guess, touch on, right, and I think it's just uh, it's sort of the elephant in the room is, you know, when a small company approaches a large company um, and the fears of that, right, or some of the, the notions of I'm a small company approaching IQV and MedTech, if I did decide to partner with them, you know, how do I know I'm not going to get quote unquote lost in the shuffle, deprioritized, right? And, and so what, how does IQV address that? Um, you know, what I can tell you is, and, and it's, I guess it goes back to why I, uh, I currently have my job at IQV and MedTech. It is my job as a business development manager to make sure that the company feels that they are taken care of. Um, I don't want to even just say adequately, but exceptionally, right? Um, and making sure that things are running smoothly, even past the point of, you know, once we decide to move forward and partner together, we put a contract in place and we start getting the, the operations, right? If things start to get bumpy, um, you know, I need the, or as a business development manager, we need the company to know and feel the trust that they could always reach out to people like me uh, to then go internally and, and, and right or wrong. Right. Or if that, hopefully that never is the case, but obviously, um, you know, that could be a, uh, a potential issue and, and how will Sam help me manage that process? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think in terms of approaching a large CRO, um, it, it's definitely a valid concern, right. Of, of being lost in the shuffle um, or, you know, where do you stand um, compared to other uh, customers? But, you know, you know, at the end of the day, we give each study its due diligence and, and attention and um, you know, every customer of ours is, is treated with uh, utmost priority. So we typically do questions at the end. We do have somebody that popped a question up here. So you want to take it now or you want to wait till we, till we get to the end? Uh, I'm happy to take it now. Um, you know, it's so a, the, uh, the question is how does IQVIA MedTech adapted? How they adapted to the increase in decentralized and streamlined trial options? I know we talked a little bit about that ourselves before we got on here. So I yeah. don't know if you want to speak to that real quickly, and then we'll move on to the next topic. No, it's a great question and, and very relevant um, as you think of uh, COVID-19 and how things have shifted yeah. um, from, you know, requiring patients to go on site to being able to bring the therapies to them, right? And, and how do you make the patient's journey and patient's life easier? Uh, so what I can tell you is we do have an internal decentralized trial platform that we're able to use for both hybrid and fully virtual studies. Uh, we have experience running both. Um, and it is something that we are um, continuously seeing uh, uh, growth in um, and, and co more companies approaching us with these types of strategies. And we have the technologies in place too, right? Um, be it uh, mobile applications, uh, ECOA platforms uh, for subjects to be able to enter in uh, our complete different forms from their home, upload their data to different data management platforms, EDCs that the companies can then use to run analysis or whatever they might look to use the data for. Um, so in terms of the, the technologies and the 
uh, in the platforms. That's something that we do have and, and offer for uh, med tech companies. Um, and, and I think to it really does come back to the strategy, right? Why do you want to run the study in a hybrid or decentralized manner, right? And that's important to understand. And we have enough experience running those studies to be able to advise companies on, you know, what sort of decentralized uh, design may, might make the most sense if they're looking for that type of input. Great. No, thanks for answering that. So let's let's switch over to, uh, to, to the career piece real quick. So for you, and your role, and let's talk a little about business development, um, and, and why you pick business development, and what kind of advice. Uh, I know right now we're working on two uh, uh, business development leader positions that you know in North America for one of our clients right. uh, that are segmenting med tech as well as uh, as biotech. So you know, let's talk a little bit about that and and what you do day to day and sort of the career path there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, when I was in uh, undergrad, right, I was a biology major. And I think going into undergrad, I had always had this idea that I wanted to go into medicine, right? And I come from a family where my mom's a nurse, uh, stepdad is an ER doctor, and that always had played a big impact on me. And I, you know, saw myself you, in, in sort of a similar sense. My mom's a nurse too, so you were never oh, hurt. Really? You were, uh, no. Like, you're not bleeding to death. You're fine. But you want to know the the back the, the 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 downside of that is I can never fake sick because they knew when I was BSing. <laughs> Let's just be real. You know they they knew if I was trying to get out of school. Um, you're not going to fool a doctor. Yeah. Um, so no, it it was something though that I thought going into undergrad that I really wanted to do. And you know as time went on, I realized that that might not be the the right career path for me. Or as I maybe I just didn't have as much of a passion for it as I thought I originally had. Right. Um, and I'd always. Uh, really enjoy just generally interacting with people, right? Being a people person, being um, extroverted and, and uh, you know, having these sorts of conversations. And, you know, I think sales and business development was lucrative in that regard, right? Being able to be customer facing. Um, I didn't necessarily know uh, going into my first role at IQVIA, which I'll get into that, you know, I would be where I am today, right? Within our med tech group, um, you know, as I mentioned, IQVIA MedTech, the brand name launched and, and the business development uh, or inside sales team. You were inside sales April. to begin with. Yeah, right. right. Mm -hmm. And so I guess just to back up, when I first joined IQVIA, I was on our pipeline fulfillment market research team. So essentially what I was doing was looking at um, uh, what is going on in the emerging biopharma and biotech market. Um, we did look at med tech uh, information as well, but there was a really strong push for us to um, look at company updates, study updates, financials, et cetera, send that information off to our business development team um, for the biotech and pharma space. And ultimately with the end goal of growing our customer base, right, within um, IQVIA Biotech. So you're kind of um, looking at what they're doing, industry trend, looking at the total accessible market and trying to identify what is potentially your serviceable uh, mm -hmm. market. Definitely. Definitely. And did that. And, and, you know, that really helped me to gain a really strong understanding of what that market looked like. Right. And how CRO um, operations work. You know, I think just getting my foot in the door was huge um, mm -hmm. and being able to work at a, an established CRO like IQVIA and, and learn, you know, how our processes work. Um, and, uh, you know, relate that to how we help our customers was really beneficial um, in helping me where, get to where I am today. Um, and like I said, you know, the inside sales group with our IQVIA MedTech uh, opened up in April 2019. And it was timing, right? I, at that time, I was looking to move into a customer facing role. Um, uh, I was sold on the idea of IQVIA MedTech and, and what we were looking to do and disrupt in the marketplace and really become a, uh, a strong um, med tech presence um, in the CRO world. And so I uh, joined that team um, in April, 2019. And then, you know, in that role, the benefit of it was I got to work not only with our CRO, but also our commercial team as well. Right. And uh, the, the, the part of our business units that help companies with market segmentation and targeting, building out sales forces, uh, for instance. So not only was I exposed to the clinical and regulatory uh, part of a company's development, but also uh, a lot of things on the commercial side as well. Yeah. That really allowed me to learn sort of the full end to end process uh, of, of what it looks like for a med tech company. Um, or what, you know, larger med tech customers look for as well in those solutions. 
Um, but I will say I really enjoyed and, and to this day still continue to enjoy the clinical aspect of it the most. Um, and it's part of the reason why I'm in this role now where I help companies, um, you know, essentially put together their pre and post market clinical strategy. Right. I, I am a business business development manager and, and liaise them with our strategy and ops folks. But that's my favorite part of what I do um, is, is helping them brainstorm. You know, what is your successful path forward look like? Um, and, and, you know, I've been fortunate to be able to work alongside some excellent thought leaders in the space who have decades of knowledge and, um, you know, are, are very well known in the med tech industry as well, um, you know, be it from legacy companies or with IQVIA, um, but they're still with now with IQVIA med tech today. It's got to um, be a, a, it's gotta be a great satisfaction in terms of helping them put that together and then seeing the end result. Absolutely. And that's, that's the best part, right. Is, is, is seeing the delivery come through. Um, and, you know, once we have the solution in place and agree to really getting into to helping them and creating that partnership, that's the best part. Um, but, you know, my job is mostly focused in those initial stages. Um, so, you know, that's the, the work I enjoy, but you're right. The watching it pay off is, 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 uh, is a great thing to see. Uh, absolutely. I mean, to, to your point, like we're, we're not on the, the, the back end of as that, whether it's an implantable or, you know, an IVD diagnostic or whatever, but mm -hmm. helping people with the right opportunities, connect the right companies to the right talent and how that's benefiting patient populations at the end of the day, that could be your family, that member, that could be ours. And what's right. going on in terms of clinical trials and, um, you know, bringing new products to market is is huge um so there's a lot of satisfaction there um that's certainly why we do what we do so uh, i appreciate you you sharing that let's talk about the pandemic we knew we were going to get into the pandemic and sort of the disruption uh there's been a lot of positive that's come obviously there's been a lot of challenges to it as well but i want to get your thoughts on what you've seen i know we were talking uh previously about some of the types of, of ai and um monitoring telehealth, all these different areas. Obviously, there's a huge amount of joint venture capital money, uh, particularly the yeah. last three quarters of, uh, of last year that were invested in those areas. So, yeah. you know, what, let, let's first talk about some of the things that you're seeing um, mm -hmm. from, a, from a product or, 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 or kind of what's coming on, going on from a, a CRO perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I was reading uh, uh, an MDDI article, uh, I think this week, and I, I believe EY reported that uh, venture capital investments for um, pre-commercial med techs globally, and this is very broad based, increased 34% from 2020 to 2021. Um, yeah. So that just goes to show you the, the inflow of capital that's going into these companies and the continued growth that we're going to uh, see in the trajectory that it's on. So that's exciting. Um, definitely a huge uh, increase in, in non-invasive diagnostic products, monitoring, um, seeing a lot of innovation in the diabetes space, right? With different um, uh, CGM plus uh, uh, insulin pump combo uh, products. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, what we're seeing or have seen a lot in the last year and been approached by um it, it definitely varies obvious the obvious one is COVID 19 diagnostics and COVID 19 ivds um rapid tests your pcrs antigen antibodies you name it you know we've we've talked to all of those companies and have done some really strong work in in helping uh some companies go for the you know eua um and and get to be able to you know provide those tests to uh COVID 19 um uh, positive subjects. But yeah, I, I think the, the biggest thing has definitely been an uptick in diagnostics and, and diagnostic tests. Um, you know, the electives, um, it's been a little bit of a flux, right? If we're being honest, right. the last year and a half. And I think for companies in that space. Um, a lot of uncertainty, a lot, a lot of things going on hold. Definitely. Um, you know, that's unquestioned. I think it's been a matter of, uh, and it goes back to timing, right? And asking us, you know, what are you seeing from the sites, right? What are what are the IRBs um, prioritizing right now? And, and I think, you know, and when we refer to the IRBs, we're talking about, you know, U.S. studies, um, just for the sake of example. Um, you know, COVID-19 has been the priority, right? Um, it, it was the the thought was to address the the pandemic and and treat it as such a pandemic right and get the the needed technologies and therapies out there uh to be able to support that 
Um, and that did affect uh, some companies in the elective space, right? And, and the IRB submission review timelines, which ultimately, ultimately will impact your FPI and, and just overall study duration. So it's something that we've been helping companies manage um, and is been very interesting to see. You know, what I can say is that uh, we definitely have started to see more of these electives um, uh, resurface and companies start to look to, um, uh, you know, bring back their R&D or increase their R&D in this space. Um, you know, I think right now in the U.S., COVID-19 numbers relatively are on a decline, um, you know, knock on wood, it stays that way. And so it, it really has been a challenge. Um, and we'll see where it is, right, four or five months from now, who knows? Um, and it's something that I think companies just have to be adaptable to and, and a CRO has to be adaptable to as well. What are you saying? Obviously, the MDR, IVDR, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's been huge on the medical device side. Uh, you look, look back two years, uh, half of the governing bodies, Actually, I think more than that went away. And then, uh, you know, there's a few that, that came back. So the the timeline there, the, you know, the pressure to get those things done. What are you seeing on, on the CRO side relevant to MDR, IVDR? Right. So MDR, um, I guess just for some background knowledge of uh, for folks that might not be as familiar with the EU, MDR and IVDR and, and how COVID-19 affected that. Um, so MDR originally was supposed to go into effect May of 2020 and IVDR May of 2021, right? Uh, once COVID-19 hit, um, uh, the EU uh, decided to accommodate uh, the pandemic and, and push some of these uh, deadlines and applications out, right? The transition from the, the traditional MDD to MDR and then IVDD to IVDR. Um, so MDR went to a place uh, or its application uh, began in, in May of this year, May of 2021. IVDR is scheduled to go into place May of 2022. Um, the uh, EU recently did just announce that um, the transition period for IVDR will be extended. Um, and it and in some cases, it depends on the class of diagnostic product um, from what we've uh, seen. So depending on the risk level of your diagnostic product, um, the transition period is either class. shorter or longer. Yep, class. So uh, with more, uh, we'll just say high risk class, it is a, a shorter transition period. You have until 2025. Uh, with lower risk, you could have up to 2027, I believe. Um, so you know, in terms of the, the market effects of EU MDR and IVDR, it's been really interesting. We certainly have seen more companies that are in a stage of determining which market to start elect to go uh, FDA first, right, as opposed to um, uh, battling the MDR and IVDR requirements and changes, um, partly because the expectation um, or what we have seen with MDR and will see with IVDR is a tightening of regulations and requirements for these products, right? And I think there a lot of companies want to uh, see it play out and better understand what these the tightening of regulations will look like before they um, go about it. Now, the benefit of the EU regulatory team within um, IQVIA MedTech is that we have a very strong pulse um, and very close communication with a lot of these notified bodies and understanding what these regulations and changes might look like. And we're able to really help companies develop a strategy for managing MDR and IBDR. Um, in addition to that, we can also help companies um, understand how different channels of real-world evidence and data could be used to um, submit for post-market surveillance uh, requirements that might be issued by uh, MDR or IBDR as well. Um, what, one thing, uh, Sam, I mean, is, is converting to MDR, one of the big aspects of, of both of those changes in regulation is the increased liability across the yep. board. Um, so I, I would think that there's a, certainly a certain aspect of consideration in, in what CR to go through in, in terms of that liability piece, too, and how you're protected or more at risk. Would you, is that correct? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's definitely a compliance impact as well. Um, and you know, what is your risk of, uh, of not, or I I should say it this way, what are the risks of a prolonged transition from MDD to MDR, IVDD to IVDR, right. And, and how will that impact, um, you know, our overall market and commercial presence if you're a, a med tech company. Um, and that's something that, um, you know, companies like IQVIA can help uh, companies manage and understand, you know, what that transition period will look like, what 
uh, the regulatory requirements will look like, right? Is there going to need to be uh, additional data generation from a clinical study to comply? Or do you already have enough data uh, collected to date to be able to satisfy those requirements? That's something that we're able to help companies understand. Um, but you're right, the compliance component of it is, is a huge aspect. Absolutely. What, as we sort of finish up here, what, what uh, types of things, do you see anything in particular over the last, let's say, six months um, to a year versus before the, the initial part of the pandemic or before the pandemic? Have you, have you noticed or seen any particular things that are coming down the pipeline or becoming more uh, accentuated? Definitely a rise in, in digital therapeutics, and I did see in software as a medical device, and actually this week, uh, the FDA issued new guidelines for AI and ML um, device products um, and a more structured guidance for them in getting to FDA approval. I think that's just going to be a huge uh, market, and I think we're going to, as, as CRO, not just like QPM MedTech, but probably any um, established CRO is going to start to see an uptick in, in companies needing uh, clinical development. Um, and I think what we are uh, moving towards is, you know, we have this, uh, the CD, CD, CDRH branch of the FDA uh, helping to uh, manage uh, sort of the med tech regulatory pathways, right? Um, I think what we're evolving to is a sort of a, a standalone branch of the FDA for, um, for digital therapeutics. Um, and, and we've seen more of these companies, right, where and when we say digital therapeutics, it could be anything from an app to help treat uh, depression or, or various CNS disorders. Um, you know, that's a very common one, actually, that we see. Um, digital therapeutics that play in combo with uh, interventional therapies to help you uh, with monitoring and tracking. I guess that relates more as a software, as a medical device, right? But how does, uh, you know the monitoring aspect of uh, taking your vitals and uploading that data to your, to your smartphone or smart tablet? Um, I think that's going to be a big uh, push in the market. And, you know, I wouldn't say it's something that we've only seen in the last six months, but it's something that we're going to continue to see more of. Yeah. You see more growth in it. It's, we've got uh, a couple of different regulatory affairs positions right now that will be working on, uh, you know, PMA, PMA supplements and software as yeah. a medical device. And software as a medical device is obviously uh, it's evolving and it's on everybody's mind. It's going to continue right. to grow. One thing I do want to note too, um, and, and it pertains to it pertains to I think how the FDA views these studies and study designs is, and, and when they do class designations, a, a large part of it right is based on predicate right. What has been done today, and and what can we base the efficacy of previous similar studies off of to then inform you what your clinical trial data needs to look like. So I think the more predicates that we see in the digital therapeutic market, the I don't want to say the easier uh, it's going to become for digital therapeutic companies to know what their pivotal study needs to look like, but it's going to be more informed, right? More and data takes, points, more data points, more frame frame of reference. It gives you more clear line of sight. And it's that's going to take time to develop. Um, there, you know, that's everything needs time, um, and and so I think it's something we'll continue to see. And um, you know, again, uh, QV MedTech is. Uh, has a close pulse on it and is helping companies manage that accordingly. Awesome. Well, I'm so grateful for you coming on, uh, giving us your time to share some information about what's going on in the marketplace, uh, opportunities, uh, to, you know, to, to partner with IQVIA when the needs are there and really for companies that are looking, that are in that process to know what they should be thinking about in terms of looking for a partner uh, and the right time for that. So I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, if we have any more questions, uh, you're welcome to throw those up there for Sam. Also, if somebody has a question that they think about later, uh, you're welcome to send it to us and we'll, we'll get it to Sam and I'm sure he'd be happy to answer that and we can get that back to you. Um, additionally, we'll be putting a white paper together for this as well as uh, video clips and the complete interview. So for anybody that's missed it or, or maybe had to to break away and then come back, you'll have the opportunity to, to see the rest of it as well. So um, don't see any more questions popping up right now, but uh, Sam said, thanks so much. We really appreciate your time. No, appreciate it, Darwin. And I want to, I guess, give a shout out here to Ryan Rush for posting that question. I see it there. Um, so I appreciate yeah. that. And um, no, it, it's been great talking with you and, and hope to do this again sometime. Absolutely. Appreciate your time. Have a great evening. 
Yeah, you too. Have a great okay. one. Hear me, would you speak to me when I open up? And I forward my thoughts to you, but sometimes I say you're thinking too much, and I don't want to hang. Oh, there's a rolling.